Welcome to this webinar hosted by the Blue Economy Cooperative Research Center. Uh, before we begin our program, on behalf of the Blue Economy CRC, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're hosting this webinar today. I'd also like to pay my respects to the elders, past and present, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people. So welcome again. I'm Lindsay White. I'm the Deputy Program Leader of one of the five research programs in the Blue Economy Cooperative Research Center, or CRC. Um, our research program is the Seafood and Marine Products one. I'm also a professor of phycology and fisheries at Auckland University of Technology, uh, with a keen interest in seaweed utilization within the blue economy um, and within the CRC. So the Blue Economy CRC was established with a 10-year uh, life under the Australian Government CRC program back in July of 2019. We now have 44 participants from Australia and around the globe. Our purpose is to undertake world-class uh, industry-focused research that will underpin the growth of the blue economy through incre increased offshore sustainable aquaculture partnered with renewable energy generation. So today's webinar is entitled Flow Interactions with Seaweed and Implications for Offshore Aquaculture. Um, tonight, uh, today we'll provide you uh, with a background to offshore seaweed aquaculture, including an Australian perspective, uh, the biophysical effects arising from interaction with waves and currents, uh, and an overview of current projects in offshore seaweed aquaculture. We'll touch on opportunities for cult cultivating seaweeds in the open oceans, uh, required adaptation to high energy environments, along with the required system design and supporting technologies. Lastly, we'll cover off uh, seaweed ocean interaction processes and the current research gaps in seaweed hydrodynamics. We'll have a Q&A session following the presentations, um, and you can find the uh, Q&A housekeeping in the chat, um, and you can add your questions along the way, uh, and we'll deal with them when we get to the end. So we've got four presentations tonight, as you can see, um, and we're going to kick off with uh, Dr. Walter Visch, who is a lecturer at the University of Tasmania, and his presentation is entitled An Introduction to Offshore Seaweed Aquaculture, Including an Australian Perspective, Scoping Studying Findings Relevant to the Ocean uh, Environment Hydrodynamics. So I'll hand it over to Walter. Thank you, Lindsay. For that introduction, let me share my screen and pop it in presenter mode. Um, well, thank you. Uh, as Lindsay mentioned, um, today we'll be talking about um, an in introduction to the offshore seaweed aquaculture and Australian perspective. Um, as I said, uh, as Lindsay mentioned, my name is Walter Fiss and I'm a lecturer at the uh, IMS at the University of Tasmania here in, in Australia. And I will be going through some like of the current status and status of and practices of seaweed aquaculture uh, and talk a bit about the research roadmap, um, opportunities and challenges and some future work that we'll be doing here uh, more specifically at, at IMAS um, to facilitate the offshore seaweed aquaculture industry. Yes, so the current status, um, they're basically just a quick recap. There are like three seaweed uh, groups, the reds, the greens, and, and the browns, and roughly all of them are uh, produced from aquaculture. Um, but currently this is mainly done in coastal and near shore environment. Um, as you can see on the photo here, which is uh, taken in China, um, Asia dominates the production and depending on the species and, and the genera, um, it, it varies a bit between uh, countries. Um, but um, roughly 500 species have historically been used for human food and uh, medicinal purposes. And yeah, of these 500, there are roughly eight seaweed genera that provide, well, all this um, production and all this biomass in the world. Um, we have nori, capophycus on the right, the two reds, and the browns, uh, the laminaria japonica, or um, um, and uh, Undaria pinetifida, and, and some sargassum species. Um, just these two genera, I just wanted to highlight this because uh, this highlights the, the importance of, of seaweeds and seaweed aquaculture in the world. Um, actually, of the list on the right-hand side, this, these are the major organisms produced in, in world mariculture. Um, two of these genera are the most produced um, organisms um, in the world globally. 
Um, one is Sakurai Japonica Kombu, as, as shown in the photo here on the left, bottom left, and Yukima or Kapafakis um, in the uh, uh, in the, uh, the other photo. And as you can see in this list, there are a whole heap of other um, species. Uh, salmon, Atlantic salmon, is somewhere here, or is it maybe eighth on the list um, in terms of biomass? Of course, this is uh, um, uh, the list is not in terms of economic value, but in terms of volume. Seaweeds are very well representative in um, uh, in in global marine culture. So. As I said, current practice is mainly done in nearshore environment, and there are limited operations in Australia. Um, but this is this is the case in in most Western countries, um, in Europe, for example, in in, um, in the Americas. Um, and in Australia, we typically rely on imports and and wild harvest to meet industry needs. So and and therefore there is a need and there is a drive to to culture these species not only in asian countries but also uh, in non-traditional regions of um, uh, of production um, and this um, there is in, in order to facilitate this drive uh, it it does make sense to do this in less contested 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 waters offshore um, and this is just a photo of of somewhere in in tasmania pirate bay um, and i think we can all agree that well Having buoys here in the water would uh, not be very um, socially accepted. So I will come. I have two challenges slides: one here and one uh, in the end of my presentation. So I think initially there there are like a lot of there are multiple challenges, but these are just the main ones uh, that are that I wanted to highlight here: are technological complexities and there are uncertainties in these offshore environments of the performance of seaweed. Uh, and uh, specifically in the Australian context, there's relatively low nutrient concentrations, both in the coastal and uh, offshore environment. Um, as uh, opposite to, for example, in, in Europe, where there's uh, typically problems of eutrophication and the same for, for China and, and other Asian countries, Australia and specifically Tasmania as well has um, have very relatively low uh, nutrient concentrations and of course there's the the challenge in terms of legislation who is going to be responsible where uh, where are we going to culture them is this are these state waters uh, or commonwealth waters and probably there's there's um, more work to be done there so uh, to facilitate this in 2020 we uh, produced uh, this uh, seaweed aquaculture scoping study and um, in order to provide sort of a a research roadmap specifically uh, in an Australian context. So what we did was uh, there was a stakeholder engagement and we identified um, uh, yeah through these stakeholders that were that came from industry government and research we highlighted different priorities um, um, during this meeting and two findings came out of here one was the there is a commercial interest focus on a on a few species so even though there are like a, a ton of different species out there in the marine environment focus on a few species that might be suitable and that there are industry-wide knowledge gaps across the sector um, um, and this is not uniquely to um, to offshore this is also uh, in in the near shore environment so following from this we there were a few species nominated uh, and they were based on desirable traits. Can they withstand any any of the offshore, um, um, or are they likely to with, withstand any of this? Existing and potential market for production and environment, bio, uh, environmental biosecurity and regulatory uh, considerations and issues were, were raised. And based on this, we um, highlighted three groups, um, basically six species. One is Duvilia. Um, Duvilia is, is of the order of then there were four kelp species um, um, identified, and then uh, Asperidopsis the rotified um, because of um, yeah because of the the recent interest in this. So I will just quickly go through them all. Um, so Davilia, as as I said, is of the order of Fucalis, which is relevant uh, in terms of um, their life cycle, uh, which is very different than. Um, for the laminary islands uh, kelp, this is more direct. Um, anyhow, we highlighted that there is a, that there is an existing market, um, speci specifically in Tasmania. There is already a, a, a harvest um, uh, industry, so they, there's wild harvest, beach cast, 
Um, Duvidia is harvested and they actually supply roughly 5% of the world's alginate um, in, in, yeah, by, uh, in this small, um, small industry. Um, there's high production potential uh, in terms of biomass, low distribution, which is restricted to basically South Australia. Again, this is in an Australian context. Um, so this is definitely not a tropical species, uh, if that's of interest. Um, and we lack basic, well, the, the current cultivation knowledge is, is quite basic. And um, even though we understand its life cycle, we cons it can be considered that the life cycle in the lab is not really closed yet. Um, but having said all that, it, it does thrive in very high hydrodynamic environments. Um, this photo is definitely uh, on the on the right hand side, is definitely on one of the calmer days. Um, and um, yeah, usually you have like high wave exposed um, locations where they, where, they, uh, where they grow. So then the four kelp species, um, they're listed on the right hand side. They're all native to, to um, South Australia. Eclonia macrocystis uh, on the top, uh, the top two photos and Lasonia and Andaria on the bottom. Um, Andaria is the invasive species. I'll discuss that a little bit later. Um, but for these species, there is an existing uh, bulk market. So th there is a bit of, of um, uh, potential there. And there's moderate to high, depending on the species, biomass production potential. Uh, and um, there's low to moderate distribution. Again, this depends on the species. So Eclonia is found all around um, uh, Australia, whereas Lasonia, for example, is, is uh, and Macrocystis in that, is, in that sense as well, is typically only found in Tasmania. And in Daria is obviously um, the odd one out where it's introduced from um, Japan and it's a, it's a nu nuisance species in that sense. Um, we do very well know how to cultivate these things. So the, the, there's a very advanced cultivation knowledge. We know its life cycle, we can culture it, we can breed it, we can make crossings, etc. Um, and depending on the species, uh, the hydrodynamic suitability varies. So uh, again, this is something that uh, needs to be uh, further explored. And then in terms of Asperidopsis, um, this is of course the species that is used in terms of ruminant and um, to reduce methane emissions uh, as a feed supplement. So there's a very high market potential. This is why it was included in our assessment basically. It's typically a small um, species, so it low in terms of biomass pr production potential, uh, but it's Typically, it's, it, it does uh, have a high distribution uh, in Australia because it is native and there's two species. Um, the one is tropical and one is, is a temperate species. So Asperidopsis amata is the temperate and Taxiformis is the, the tropical species, uh, which makes it interesting in terms of uh, cultivation in, in Australia. So uh, there is basic um, cultivation knowledge. Again, similar to um, Dervilia, the life cycle is not closed and um, I'm not a Asperidopsis specialist, but my understanding is that males have still not been found in, in, in the field even. So it's, it's, um, it's a tricky species to, to culture if you want to uh, culture it uh, sexually. And uh, one of the things that came out of this was it's typically, it grows in more sheltered areas. So it, it has very low hydrodynamic suitability. Um, I'm not sure if this species will withstand uh, uh, 10 meter waves, for example. Anyhow, this is a, 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 a table. I want you not to <laughs> read all of this. This is, ba I've, I've basically walked you through all this, uh, this whole table, going through all the species, as you can see here, the seaweed species with their, um, with their photos, uh, the related photos, and we've scored them very roughly uh, from one to three, and you can see the average uh, scores here. So Dervilia is, is relatively high in terms of um, uh, species to prioritize uh, for offshore cultivation. Um, the, the tricky thing here is the cultivation knowledge, like we have to close the life cycle, uh, and that that's um, the, main, the main barrier. Um, for the kelps, it's for the true kelps, the laminarian kelps, um, it depends on the species. Um, and where it where it is uh, is cultured, and Asperidopsis, we uh, believe to, that it's not very well suited for uh, offshore cultivation, which is uh, probably not too su not surprising, but uh, interesting nonetheless. So this this um, um, was recently published uh, in uh, um, reviews in aquaculture. If if anyone is interested.
So now we wanted to talk a bit about uh, the opportunities. So we have all these different species and we've only um, really focused on the ones that, that came out of, um, um, of this, uh, this workshop. So we have a solid knowledge base here in, in Australia, typically on the ecology of most of these species, but uh, we, I believe, and, and I think most people uh, would agree that we first have to sort of understand the near shore cultivation. And this can be either in conjunction with existing uh, aquaculture, for example, in an IMTA setting, uh, which in, in, again, in an Australian context will eliminate or um, um, alleviate the nutrient, the lack of nutrients, um, uh, that, that issue. And we have to, of course, um, follow up on the potential for offshore um, and specifically the Vilia, uh, but also um, the Laminarian kelps. So again, another challenging slide, <laughs> challenges slide. Uh, I think um, there are these knowledge gaps across these commercial scale of production. They have to be um, tackled. We need to tackle the low nutrient concentrations and uh, again, specifically for Australia and more, uh, even more specific for, for Tasmania are, uh, is coastal warming. Um, I think Tasmanian waters are um, warming by, at a rate of 3 to 4% the, the global average. So this is very much uh, an issue. And of course, there are many, many more challenges, but I, I believe the other panelists will, will discuss those. But these are the ones that I, I wanted to highlight. Um, and then uh, finally, I wanted to talk a bit about what we hear specifically in Tasmania and, and following up from, from what I've just said, uh, what we're hopefully uh, will achieve and, and focus on in our research is uh, we will further optimize the laminarian kelps. As you can see in the photo there, we've, we've done trials with microcystis. Um, there's still lots of variation and more, more exploration needed. Um, and we recently um, started a project on Duvidia. Um, so that's that's very uh, like interesting as well, uh, closing the the, um, the life cycle there uh, in in terms of in the lab, and then venture offshore. Once we have nailed and we've we've understand the the uh, the near shore um, um, cultivation, I think we we can uh, see if we if if offshore is an option, um, and this is again. A, don't want to sound like a broken record, <laughs> but in Australia it's very much an issue. The nutrients, um, the, the seaweeds are, are nitrogen deprived, if you will. And I think uh, I haven't talk, spoken about this uh, throughout any of the other slides, but I think domestication or selection for strains that can withstand, for example, um, um, offshore uh, environment better um, is also uh, an, an avenue worth of, of exploring. Uh, for example, stronger hold fast uh, so they don't detach uh, or, or any of these sorts of um, traits that might be of interest. Um, yeah, that was it for me. And uh, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please shoot me an email. Okay, well, thank you very much, Walt, for your presentation. And if there are uh, questions, please feel free to put them in the chat window and we'll get to them um, after the next uh, three presentations. So coming up next is uh, Dr. Louise uh, Craigting from um, Plant and Food Research here in New Zealand. Um, and she is going to give us a presentation on the biophysical effects arising from interaction with waves and currents. So I think I'll just hand it over to Louise. Thanks very much, Lindsay. Um, that's great. And thanks very much for the um, uh, invitation to give a presentation this, af this afternoon, evening um, for everybody. Um, I wanted to discuss basically sort of the past research I've been doing since my PhD on the benefits of water motion for growth and um, biology of the um, biomass production of seaweeds and sort of what we learned already from a lot of the uh, environmental side and how that how we can use some of that information for culturing in the future and actually while for some of the stuff that we've been I've been doing might actually be quite beneficial for trying to grow stuff offshore um, in the future. So we're, we're well aware that um, seaweeds, they require light, temperature and nutrients for um, optimal growth. And of course, another thing that, I mean, I've been working on this for a, a, quite some time now, but is, is how water motion influences both um, things like nutrient uptake and also growth rates and then biomass and morphology, et cetera, and, and biomechanical properties of seaweed. So um, looking at this sort of can make some generalizations now in, in um, 
nutrient uptake generally has a positive response to water motion. I'm just going to show you a couple of um, different species. We worked on a small red seaweed, uh, Adamsella chavonii, which is a subtital species. So in the in the lab, doing nutrient uptake, uh, looking at particular uh, ammonium uptake, we can see quite clearly there's an increase in uptake um, as you increase water velocity. Uh, this is um, both observed and seasonal. So um, in this particular case is the Southern Hemisphere, July and January. So July is winter and January is summer. Um, we carried out some work on the Laminaria digitata, but also looked at oscillatory motion. So the Adamsiella chavonii was in current flow. But when we look at it in, in oscillatory, we can also see a um, increase in nitrate uptake um, for the Laminaria. Um, and this was for both oscillatory and unidirectional. There wasn't really any difference between oscillatory or unidirectional, but the, the bottom line was that basically uh, the, the you increase flow and you, you increase uptake. And this is all to do with the diffusion boundary layers. Uh, so the increasing flow, you have a reduction in the boundary layers so that the seaweeds can um, access the nutrients uh, quicker. So basically we've seen a positive response has been work on macrocystis as well, and it's shown quite clearly that um, nutrients will be influenced by velocity. The growth rate, however, is being varied. Um, there's a number of different uh, species I've worked on now for growth rate, looking at the field and also within the um, in, uh, in laboratory situations. And I just thought I'd walk through just a couple of uh, examples. So laminaria digitata, we looked at oscillatory and unidirectional. We certainly got a response during winter and summer, as you would expect, um, but there was very little influence of water motion in the winter on the growth rate, but you had you saw more influence um, during the summer um, for the growth. When we looked at the moving towards the field, when we actually do field measurements, which is a lot more difficult to try and obtain growth rates, and especially under um, water motion, um, for the Adamsella chavonii, that grows generally in a very current-dominated environment. But what we could see clearly there was definitely a difference between slow flow sites um, and, and more medium flow sites. And also, it was a bit difficult with the high flow because of the, the challenges with working there that got inundated um, during with sand, so we couldn't get those measurements. But there was a clear difference between the slow flow, slow flow site and the um, medium flow site. Looking at the Laminaria digitata, so that's now an intertidal species, is a bit more uh, the brown kelp um, along the shores in the northern hemisphere here. Um, this work was carried out um, in 2016 and 17 over two different years and summers, uh, years and season. And we just looked at the meristematic region um, of the growth and the basically just to simplify it, we've got a wave site which is in blue, a current site which is in pink, and then we've got a low wave, low current site in green. And you can see clearly throughout the whole entire um, time that measurements, the wave site actually had the lowest um, growth rate. Current sites tended to have a lot um, higher growth rate. That was for the for the Laminaria digitata, which is a, is a um, intertidal species. But when we look at the actually the subtitle species, the Laminaria hyperborea, which grows to about two to three meters, we definitely get a seasonal trend with the uh, growth rate. But what we didn't see was a difference in the growth rate, and that was between uh, a, a sort of a, a wave low a low wave site, a high wave site, but also in two different depths. So at the shallower depth, we would expect more wave action and then lower depths, less wave action. But for hyperborea, we didn't see actually any differences in their growth rate. So there's a lot of different factors possibly influencing um, the different responses. For the Adamsiella chavonii, which is a small red species, it, it grows in very uh, current uh, places. It's actually growing in the soft sediment environment. And it was quite clear that there was a lot of sedimentation on the blades themselves. We think that actually it's the lower flows wasn't, it was actually limiting their uptake because there was a lot of sedimentation. When it comes to the um, uh, difference in, you know, between waves and currents, we think potentially there's dif differences in an energy allocation. And I'll show you uh, shortly about the biomechanical properties and how they can change with wave action or um, in season as well but also potentially seawater nutrients. So in the summertime, 
if you have low, high, uh, less diffusion boundary layers, so more wave, and wave activity or more motion, then there's uh, less, less distance for the particles to travel so that the seaweeds are actually able to get more nutrients. So there's these possible factors all influencing the growth response, but um, it's just sort of, it depends on the species. As you can see, we've got a small red species, subtitle, intertidal species, and also, you know, larger kelps. And then the macrocystis, there's also been work showing that they also respond um, differently to different waves and current environments as well. And just to show you um, about the sort of potentially for the allocation of energy, uh, we've got here the um, breaking stress um, of the meristematic region of and the distal region of the, the limit laminary digitata, the intertidal species. Now the meristem, where the, the growth part of the um, plant occurs, uh, we get there's a greater breaking stress in the summer than there is in winter. So they're actually easy, um, Yes, the, so this, yes, it's difference in summer and winter, but there wasn't really any difference between whether it was high, you know, wave current or uh, low wave and low current. When we look at the distal part, which is the older part of the plant, and it could be, uh, there, there was definitely a big difference between the, the amount of um, uh, stress required to actually break. Um, and this was also a difference between the summer and the winter, and especially for the uh, low wave, low current site. So we can see quite clearly that there is definitely, whether it's wave or whether it's current, it's going to have, for this particular species, there's importance on the biomechanical properties. So putting this all this information together, the question I sort of posed was, well, um, you know, how can we use this, what we know from the field and how can we use this um, in, in understanding, to, you know, for cultivation, um, especially when, you know, cultivation at the moment, a lot of the time begins in these nurseries, you know, under just aerated seawater, so not much water motion. And we know we can get, you know, grow quite large um, kelps. I mean, this is our work that was carried out in Queen's University in Belfast. Um, they, the, the farm there at that particular year, we managed to get 20 tonnes of wet weight material from these uh, Laminera sac uh, saccharina. Uh, Latisma. So we know that we can get, you know, good growth, but this is quite a benign site. And as um, Walter, you, you just pointed out, you know, inshore space is becoming a premium. It's not going to be a place where we can do a lot of this growth. We need to sort of move offshore. And, you know, um, the seaweeds need to be able to be able to grow offshore as well. And this, going back to, you know, when we're thinking about plants, um, they change the scale, scales from the whole plant to the cells um, to acclimate to wind. So we know that, you know, they need to acclimate to wind before they go from the greenhouse right into the into, um, growing out in the field. So can we do similar things with the seaweeds? So basically, um, we looked at the potential benefits of um, preconditioning sort of seaweeds um, to, to water motion. Um, and this hasn't really been done before. So we're, we're exploring this and whether it was work, you know, whether you can precondition seaweeds um, to see how they um, behave. And we, a study that I'm just going to go through now is just to determine whether physically conditioning saccharina latissima in the nursery um, influences, you know, what you see out in the field. Will it be a benefit to growth at, at the field stage? So we've got here, um, you know, the normal cultivation of seaweeds um, basically stage here put up the lines and you place it into and just where some green motion is and just on water motion. So that some they both had sort of a um uh some some F um, stones, but basically the, the, there was two treatments. So one was the oscillatory and one was just sort of static that you would expect. We looked at what the growth was, uh, uh, the length of the blades were after the um, time in, in, the, in the nursery stage, that was seven weeks. And then we placed them out into the field to look at after four and a half months, what this, what, you know, what influence that did so if you, you're putting them out um, 
you know, are they, is there a, a benefit to growing them under oscillatory motion? Um, the, the conditions were all, you know, your, your typical uh, um, culturing system. There was a 12 degrees um, water temperature, 12, 12 hours light, um, quite low le levels of light for these uh, particular cows, 20 to 30 micromoles, and then they just get water changed weekly. So we could just see what the difference was between, um, you know, the, the hatchery phase or the, the nursery phase and then going out into the field. When we look at just the um, after the nursery, interestingly, the length was a lot longer. So the little the blades were a lot longer in just static movement. Now, this is sort of what you would um, you do tend to expect in these kind of environments, there's not any forces on them, so they're growing uh, longer. But interestingly, the density was actually a lot higher in the water movement. So we had a lot more um, blade material, a lot more um, plants basically growing on the, when they were in oscillatory motion versus uh, the still. So there was definitely big differences between the two, but how this translates to out in the field is, is the next question. So then we looked at, um, put them out in the field, obviously the four and a half months, and we looked at then sort of, we compared uh, what most people do is the blade length to start with. So if we look at the 12 longest sporophytes from each line, um, we had four replicates of each of these, these lines um, out in the field. Um, this, basically there was no difference between whether they'd been growing in oscillatory, preconditioned oscillatory motion or just sort of still water, except for the stipe length. The stipe length was actually longer um, for the ones that had been in the oscillatory motion. But when we actually came to look at the, the biomass, um, we can see that there's quite a clear difference in the, the biomass and the density of the... Um, sorry. Apologies for that. Uh, the total biomass, um, we had a, a big difference in both. So we had a lot greater um, biomass and density for the seaweeds that had been preconditioned in oscillatory motion um, compared to the still. And this was, uh, um, as you can see here, the total density was a lot higher in the total weight. And actually it was a 15% increase in biomass to when they were pre-exposed to water and 15% greater um, pre um density when pre-exposed to water. So you can see there's quite a lot of difference between the two. And just to sort of, you know, when we think about that, it's like there's a few questions to be to, to look at or to think about, but we know that seaweeds benefit from water motion, um, definitely for nutrient uptake. So the, the more, you know, they need some form of water motion uh, for nutrient uptake. We know that the growth response to water motion is quite var um, variable um, in the field. It's generally a positive response, but this is not always the case, but it just depends on what, what parameters you're also looking at. Um, similar to sort of what you would expect in a lot of um, environments, when you've got a lot lower flow, you tend to get bigger, um, sort of wider blades and longer. Um, and so we had smaller seaweeds when we had oscillatory. This is the nursery phase compared to the, um, um, what you know, to the, uh, well, what you would expect is that they were longer and we were thinking um, is this sort of, you know, a little bit, they looked quite flimsy before we put them out in the field. So what we're, you know, there are always some exceptions, but generally smaller seaweeds in a higher water motion environment anyway. Um, but the interesting part was, even though this was two like oscillatory motion, preconditioned to oscillatory motion, and then the um, and then the static, putting them out into the field. Now our site is very benign; there was not much wave activity, and unfortunately, that's what I sort of wanted to test was if you put them out in quite a high flow or more wave activity, would the ones that were preconditioned to water motion actually have a better chance of withstanding those forces? than um, the, the static. But we still saw an increase in the yield, so 15% higher. So in that respect, that was definitely um, an advantage, especially when you're talking tonnages of weight um, for growing seaweeds on lines. 
the question now, and this needs further investigation, is whether the greater effort cost in the hatchery is worth the 15% increase. Um, this work needs to be assessed. Um, and there's a lot of other uh, interesting things. The, the other um, aspect that we did of this work was that actually we did it over the summertime. Now, generally, um, the Laminera digitata you do over the, uh, they grow mainly over the winter. So generally they get put out in sort of uh, November, December time, and then they get harvested in March. We did it actually over the summer. But I think if there's a greater manipulation where the conditioning seaweeds to hydrodynamics put them at advantage when placed out in the exposed area as exposed um, as opposed to benign, you know, we need to test this. So there's a bit of extra re more research to be done, but it was an interesting outcome, even just in a benign um, region that we had uh, the quite a good um, yeah, we had we had a good response from the seaweeds uh, when we preconditioned them to hydrodynamics. Um, and that's concludes the talk. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much, Louise. That was um, really interesting. And, and um, our next speaker uh, is Professor Vila Buck, um, who has a, a lot of experience, um, perhaps some of the most experience of actually cultivating seaweed in, uh, in exposed environments. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing um, from Vila. Uh, who's going to talk about a, a, an overview of current projects in offshore seaweed um, agriculture. Okay, uh, thank you, Lindsay. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank you and your colleagues for this invitation to give a presentation on this webinar. My name is Bela Buck. I'm working at the Alfred Wegener Institute for Polar and Marine Research in Northern Germany. Um, I'm a marine biologist and I primarily work in aquaculture and moving aquaculture operations off the coast into high energy environments. So uh, today I would like to give some examples of, of the research we have done, how seaweed can adapt to high energy environments and I will focus on the project which just started on multi-use. Okay, so um, even if I'm based even if I'm based on the mainland, uh, there's another island where we have a field station called Helgoland. This is about 60 kilometers off the coast. It's uh, famous for this uh, rocky shore and these 300 different seaweed species located around Helgoland. Um, but for the studies in, 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 in the 80s and 90s, they just collected the seaweed and took it to the lab, so there was not too much aquaculture. However, uh, yeah, in the early 90s, they started to do some aquaculture around Helgoland. And since Helgoland is so far away off the coast, it is located in an environment which is quite rough. So the first trials uh, started with, I'd say, great enthusiasm to have different farm designs which is a kind of grid and ladder constructions uh, put into the sea, as well as some ring constructions, as you can see here, uh, right on, on the bottom. Um, and uh, they had success. That was where the first, yeah, let's say, mass production was set into motion. However, not too much was known about uh, moving aquaculture in high energy environments. So they had to struggle and had a lot of losses. So, for example, anchor stones uh, were designed uh, uh, with several tons and for some reason were lost and not found again. Or you see these entangled part of this grid construction, which will never be used again. Or in operation and maintenance, how to harvest these large constructions. Um, or the rings got entangled as well. So there were a lot of problems which have to be solved. And uh, so in the early 2000, uh, that's where I started at RV. I had some new ideas and open ocean aquaculture. There were several conferences with new designs and new ideas. So we improved all these different designs and um, yeah, set it up again. And uh, they resisted, re resisted these high energy environments. So it was partly submerged. It was a one point mooring with a tension neck. So, I mean, this is 
maybe not the, the commercial scale yet, but still we found some, some designs which can resist these high energy environments. So, however, uh, even if the design or the technology we are using withstands uh, high waves and currents, what about the seaweed? So to find out whether algae resist the mechanic forces uh, offshore or in exposed environments, we did some stress tests, uh, namely once uh, the force needed to dislodge uh, the hold fast or to break the stipe. So um, to, to break the stipe, it's measured in Newton. You can see on the y-axis and on the x-axis, it is the dislodgement of the hold fast. And we are using seaweed, which were adapted to strong currents, more than one meter per second, or wild algae, which are from more protected areas. And as you can see here, you we can the, the bigger the seaweed are, uh, the more forces we need to dislodge them or to break the stipe. And for the wild algae, it's much less. It's about five to fifteen newtons, and here it's about yeah, 25 to 100 newtons. Here, this one is the K1 uh, seaweed. I come to that later. Um, so to find out the drag coefficient, which is needed uh, to calculate the forces, uh, we measured different sizes of uh, seaweed from cultivated high energy environments and um, from, from the wild, and also some seaweeds, which were in a, in a bunch and measure the drag forces by using the seaweed um, in different speeds in the current flume that is uh, here from the HSVA located in Hamburg. They have a current and wave tank up to 300 meters long. And uh, the speed we use to uh, put the seaweed through this tank is about um, 1.5, 1, no, sorry, 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5 and two meters per second. And um, the results are shown in the drag coefficient, which levels very uh, to roughly 0 0.03 for the cultivated seaweed. It's not really leveled for the wild uh, seaweed, but also for the bunches, which means that obviously the cultivated seaweed um, would adapt and would find a solution for all these strong waves and currents but the wild seaweed are not adapted to that. And the reason for that is, uh, sorry, uh, I come to that in one slide. Um, so we, we, we try to find out knowing the drag forces and knowing the, the drag coefficient, how these seaweed would adapt or resist these strong environments offshore. Here again, we have the seaweed K1 and we put this seaweed, uh, uh, we modeled the data with a two meter wave and a period of five seconds for different current velocities. And then you can see that this seaweed experiences at least for this two meters per second, roughly 12 newtons. When we move the same seaweed into a worst case scenario with 6.4 meter wave height, two meter uh, per second uh, current velocity and a period of six seconds, then this large seaweed experiences 35 newtons and as we knew from the measurement before to dislodge uh, the stipe uh, the, the hold force or to break the stipe we need more than 70 newtons so these seaweed which when they are um, cultured in high energy environments they can resist the strong forces and the reason for that is that they have a completely different morphology those who seaweed cultured uh, in protected areas, they have a undulated and wide morphology, while those which are from exposed areas are flat and streamlined. The species here is uh, Saccharina latissima, so the, the sugar kelp. And this one here, uh, we cultured in a rotation tank um, uh, on land, and they get this corkscrew morphology because they are rotating 24 hours a day. So they, they quickly adapt to this uh, situation where they are cultured. Um, however, we can really, uh, we found a solution to even support this uh, adaptation. And that is when we seed uh, the young ones on the rope. Um, so the, the, um, 
the Gambito fights are already settling here on the ropes. And once there are the sporo fights and they have a length of roughly one millimeter in length, we transfer them uh, to the sea. And before they reach this uh, length, uh, these drums are rotating so that the seaweed already experiences some uh, drag forces and some currents uh, while they are on land. And that improves the stability of the holdfast and the stipe. So they are more putting more energy in the holdfast and the stipe, but not in the length. But later, once they are at, um, off the coast in that offshore location, um, they get a, a length of about two, two and a half meters after six months. Okay, so um, we are also working in multi-use and we are doing this since more than 20 years. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, Germany <coughs> and as other countries in Europe decided to set up offshore wind farms. And before we had the first offshore wind farm, we already had the first offshore multi-use site, uh, and we are combining uh, aquaculture operations um, with wind farms, as well as passive fishery operations and ecotourism. What you can see here is the outcome of one of these new projects called Muti, uh, called Muses. So we are for all the water bodies within the EU and uh, Europe, um, we, we included all these different stakeholders, the different utilizations, and try to find out how they can be combined. And uh, for example, here for, for Germany, what you can see here, this, this area here before it reaches the dotted line is the coastal sea and everything beyond that is the EEZ, which is about 28,000 square kilometers, which is about nothing compared back to Australia, which has more than 8 million square kilometers, which is about 260 times more than German uh, EEZ. Um, and that's the reason why it is overloaded uh, with uses. So this is everything we do in the, in the German Bight in the North Sea. Uh, and the, the outcome of this is that the entire coastal sea, so everything from the mainland up to 12 nautical miles is either protected or overused. Um, this dotted line here, that circle is because of that island Herwoland, which I mentioned before. So now I will superimpose some, uh, sorry, uh, that is the wind farm we work in. This is an offshore wind farm north of Helgoland, about 12 nautical miles off the coast of Helgoland. And we are doing research there on different technologies and designs. And uh, you can see here, these are all the, the wind farms which are in operation. The wind farm I'm talking about is that one here. And now I superimpose some of the wind farms which are planned. And the outcome of this is there is a vast area where only the wind is used. So the area between the wind turbines is not used. So we can use that for different purposes. That can be restoration, that can be uh, carbon sequestration, or it can be aquaculture. And uh, why I'm mentioning this, uh, we use these data we got from the wind farm operators to find out which species can be cultured where. And uh, so the, the green ones here are the, the seaweed and the light greens are uh, the, the oysters and the mussels. Due to the fact that uh, the North Sea uh, has a natural eutrophication, even in offshore environments, the concentration of nutrients is high enough to culture the seaweed, which is different in other areas in the oligotrophic areas. So I will enlarge uh, this map here. And uh, this is our, these are the wind farms closer to the coast. And we figured out what kind of IMTA uh, combinations could be possible. And uh, here are the, the fish species, here are the, the species of the bivalves, and here's the seaweed. And uh, yeah, some of the species can be cultured easy, uh, also from a commercial point of view. Uh, however, the technology uh, which resists these offshore environments in combination in an IMTA is partly available, but still too expensive. So there's a new project. It's a new project called Ola Moore, 
it is offshore low traffic aquaculture and multi-use scenario realization. Um, that is a, a project which just started on the 1st of January this year. It lasts four years and we can get an extension of another five years if we are um, you know, successful. And we have three case studies. One is in Germany and the same wind farm I just showed you. Another one uh, is here at Kriegersflak in the uh, Baltic led by Denmark, and another one is uh, a multi-use with an offshore, uh, with, a, with a fish farm uh, off the coast of Estonia. And we are testing a half commercial realization. So the EU is not putting money in that to find out again, uh, does the seaweed grow and how long and do we have enough nutrients and what about the mussels? We all know this. So the EU wants realization. Uh, realization of being half commercial means that you at least have to have some uh, backbones for seaweed and uh, mussels or other technologies. And the technology we want to use is um, in an area in the south of that wind farm. So that is the grid of the wind farm. And we have to take care that we are not digging uh, anchor uh, anchors or putting anchor stones on the grid. So we have a site which is about uh, uh, 10 hectares in size in the southern part of that wind farm, which is about one hour away from the island of Helgoland. And in there, we want to set up something like this. Uh, that is the shellfish tower, which was invented at Cawthorn Institute by Kevin Heisman in New Zealand. Uh, Kevin is, a, uh, is in the board of uh, that uh, project. And we will have a modified version of that shellfish tower. So that is a one point mooring tension leg construction. And in here you can see these are um, little boxes for oyster cultivation. We will have a round version, which is um, <clears throat> a little bit like, like this one here for culturing ulva. So uh, that is a first trial, the, the first Shellfish tower would be slightly different being smaller to handle it, but in the future it will be bigger with the subunits adapted to, yeah, to ulva cultivation. We will also have a, a submerged backbone construction that will be, will be a smart farm device from Norway, um, but currently we don't know how we will have uh, the mooring. Is it a, a drill anchor or is it an anchor stone or a dengfon uh, anchor it's still in operation uh, in um, uh, in um, design process all this will before we put it at sea we'll go into with the current flume and we will use everything to test that in ocaflex in the modeling software before we set it up at sea so at the end uh, most of the stuff i showed you is published in that book. It is an aquaculture perspective of multi-use sites in the open ocean. It's open access. Uh, the EU, EU stuff, all this multi-use and what hinders multi-use in European water bodies is in that multi-use ocean action plan, which is published by the EU. And to understand what multi-use really means, it's published here in Frontiers. It's also in, in open access. And that's it. Thank you for listening. Uh, thanks a lot, Bill. That was um, fantastic. And um, as I said um, to, to the audience, um, Bill has probably got some of the most experience in terms of growing seaweeds in these high energy environments. So I encourage you to um, look at the, um, the, the, uh, the, the documents that he put at the end of his talk there. Um, we're uh, now going to move on to our final presentation, which is um, going to be by uh, Professor Ryan Lowe, who's um, a, a professor in the Ocean Graduate School at uh, University of Western Australia. And he's going to talk to us about uh, seaweed uh, ocean interaction processes and some of the research gaps um, around seaweed hydrodynamics. So I'll hand it on to you, Ryan. Thanks, Lindsay. Can you hear me? Yep, perfect. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to, um, the final um, segment, just talk about some of the, um, you know, the challenges with understanding how seaweeds interact with hydrodynamic processes. And so this ties into a lot of the, the um, issues that were um, uh, covered in the previous talks. And really, in this case, talking about some of the implications for those interactions in terms of attenuating current and wave energy in the offshore environment. 
So um, a lot of the, the background on the, this problem and why, why this is an important um, issue for, for offshore seaweed aquaculture is highlighted well in um, the uh, seaweed aquaculture scoping study in the CRC led by Jeff uh, Wright um, that Walt Wouter um, referred to as well in his talk earlier. Um, and just a few of the points of what are some of the, the challenges, the knowledge gaps, um, and the opportunities really, is that when we think about offshore seaweed aquaculture, the, as we move into deeper water, we often have more um, energetic ocean conditions, so higher energy wave conditions and currents that you might find in nearshore coastal regions. Um, we know, um, and I'll talk about specific examples of this, um, that seaweed has the capacity to naturally attenuate um, ocean currents and waves, so removing some of that energy from the natural environment. And for this reason, there's been a lot of um, thinking and um, it's really a kind of embodied in the, the CRC is how we can co-locate offshore operations. So for example, is it possible to use the capacity of offshore seaweed aquaculture to attenuate um, hydrodynamic energy to, for example, protect other types of offshore infrastructure and also the operations, so providing safer operations. So this could be operations around an infrastructure around fin fish aquaculture and um, offshore energy. I think a good summary statement in that um, seaweed aquaculture scoping study is that, you know, quote, um, this topic is relatively understudied and subtleties among the existing research make it challenging to generalize about the effects of seaweed on hydrodynamics in offshore locations. And so I'll talk about some of the, the studies that um, kind of feed into that narrative. So in terms of understanding and coming up with ways to predict how um, seaweeds can attenuate flows, um, there's a wide range of different applications. So Luis's talk was really covered nicely some of the, the reasons we need to understand hydrodynamic processes, um, including with natural um, seaweeds. So some of the biophysical processes like, like nutrient uptake and, and so on. Um, also, we need to understand these interactions um, for the design of offshore seaweed aquaculture facilities. You can look at this example, for example, um, on the right, where we have this long line aquaculture where the suspended um, seaweed that's growing on that is gonna, um, as we have flows moving across that, it's gonna generate forces. It creates loads on this, um, this structure here, which is gonna affect the, the loads on the moorings, the anchors and so on. So we need to understand how these interactions affect those type of um, loading. Um, as I mentioned, as we look at um, say fish, uh, fin fish aquaculture offshore and offshore um, energy that's moving into deeper water where we can have um, energetic conditions, can we um, build offshore um, seaweed aquaculture facilities around that to, to protect those. And also stepping further back, there's a lot of um, questions about using nice features in the environment to um, reduce coastal hazard risks like flooding and erosion. And so another question and another application is, can kelp forests, natural or farmed, um, be used to protect um, coastline by removing wave energy and, and current energy? So what I want to um, just do before I start talking about some of the, the state of the knowledge and knowledge gaps is really discuss some really gen general fundamental principles that determine how seaweed interact um, with their environment. And, the, and this really gets at understanding hydrodynamic forces, namely drag forces, because it's these drag forces then that are ultimately directly attributable to attenuating and, and reducing flows um, in the um, ocean environment. Um, just a couple equations. So this um, equation here shows an expression, a very classic expression for how drag forces on bluff objects are parameterized. Um, so this is, for example, if we have a, there's gonna be a, if we have a flow, it's going to exert a force on that, um, that uh, seaweed. And that force is gonna depend on a, uh, three fundamental kind of parameters. One is the, 
the flow velocity. Um, and it's the velocity squared. So this is what's called a quadratic drag law. Um, it's also important to emphasize that this is the relative flow velocity. So if the um, seaweed is moving, it's the velocity relative um, of the water motion relative to the, the seaweed motion. Um, another important parameter is this area. This is important because um, it's a frontal area projected into the flow. So as a, a seaweed deflects over, its, its area um, projected into the flow can um, decrease. So this flexibility is what creates one of the challenges with predicting loads on, on um, seaweeds. And also this is all linked through um, what we call a drag coefficient. That's really an empirical parameter that we would you know, obtain from, from experiments. The reason um, understanding these forces on individual seaweeds is important is because the sum of, if we have a large number, an array or what we call a canopy formed by a large number of um, individuals, the forces that are exerted on those individuals are similarly exerted back onto the water column and so it's these drag forces that are that are end up reducing or attenuating the flow for in this case we're looking at a mean current which is just a unidirectional um, current so the drag that um, that is exerted in the water column reduces the flow and you can see in this case where we have this submerged vegetation that's creating a velocity deficit or a reduced flow near the bed and this flow attenuation depends on properties of the seaweed canopy um, the current speed and also how that drag force is distributed in the water column. Um, this is important because where we have the seaweed located in the water column determines where that flow attenuation is. This is sort of a really idealized view of what you would have for these, um, like say some kind of uh, vegetation that extends over the entire water column where you would have more of a uniform velocity profile, a submerged canopy at the bottom where there'd be a velocity deficit at the bottom, or what's quite, to um, offshore kind of seaweed aquaculture applications is we, we have a suspended canopy where we can have a velocity deficit due to those drag forces at the, um, at the surface and higher velocities um, down near the bottom of the ocean. If we want to understand what is responsible and how, you know, for causing uh, attenuation of waves, it's similarly related to understanding drag forces. Um, and this is, What's really shown here is that um, when we want to understand the processes that are responsible for, for removing wave energy, um, which is essentially reducing wave heights over some distance, it's related to um, the work that is done by the drag forces. So it's essentially taking the, the force that is exerted by the seaweed times the velocity and, and the time average of that. And so the, the amount of wave height attenuation is proportional to the work done by these drag forces. So similarly, we need to understand the drag that seaweeds exert on the, the water to also understand um, wave attenuation. So really, those are some of the simple kind of concepts that are used to understand um, drag and, and flow attenuation in the environments. But if we step back and we look at where, what are the applications in the wide range of scenarios that we find in practice? This is really challenging because we have really a diverse range of site conditions where we're interested in. They can have very different wave and current conditions. Um, different seaweed species have very different morphologies um, and material properties that affect um, how they move with water motion and the drag forces they exert. And also, there's diverse kind of ways that um, seaweed occur in, in the environment. We could have natural growing seaweeds versus farmed um, seaweeds that can determine where those drag forces and that energy is dissipated. So it can vary quite, um, be quite different depending on what type of seaweed farming technique you, you also use. Um, what I just wanted to do here is just talk about some of the current state of, of the literature, just summarizing some of the studies. There's probably um, more studies, but this is sort of a, a flavor of what, where the state of the literature is. Um, and first, I want to talk about um, studies that are related to understanding 
um, current flow attenuation. So this is how seaweeds and arrays of seaweed reduce currents in the ocean environment. Um, grouped by, you can see the number of studies here. So a lot of the, the studies are focused on Macrocystis periphera, so giant kelp. Um, these are the methods. So quite a lot of, you know, nine studies here that are um, measuring current flow attenuation in um, the field environment, some in laboratory, kind of controlled laboratory studies. Um, and also some of the applications. So looking at natural kelp forests in this case here versus a, a smaller number that are looking at current flow attenuation in um, aquaculture. And so really some of the summaries of, of this, this work is really that um, seaweeds can be very effective at reducing um, current speeds. Um, but again, it's gonna really depend heavily on the, the, the type of um, seaweed, the density, the areas. Um, just to show one example, so a lot of the studies that do exist are looking at um, giant kelp, like I mentioned. A lot of the work is in um, off the west coast of the US, where you can see one example on the right, where this is essentially measuring the tidal currents um, outside of a kelp forest area, and then there's about a 300 meter diameter patch of this kelp forest, and you can see how the, the um, current velocities decrease um, by about 70% in this case. So the flow is essentially diverted around that, that kelp forest and within the kelp forest itself, it is re substantially reduced the, the flow speeds. So some of the general findings of these is that, and these are somewhat intuitive that, you know, the flow attenuation increases with current speed um, and, but only to a point where um, eventually as I'll talk about the, the seaweed can, deflect and bend and it becomes more streamlined and it becomes less effective at, at reducing um, the flow. Really the take on point here is that a lot of these findings are highly site specific um, and species specific as well. In terms of um, studies that have looked at wave attenuation, this is where there's probably even more variation um, and in, inconclusive kind of um, findings. Again, a lot of the studies that um, exist that have quantified wave attenuation are well, the Macrocystis periphera and other, other species here. Um, studies ranging from field observations often that have more um, uncertainty and an increasing number of experiments conducted in, in laboratory controlled environment settings. Um, these studies have looked at natural um, seaweeds, as well as those very limited number that are in um, aquaculture applications. And just to really summarize some of these, these findings, um, really they're highly variable, um, where you know, some studies have come to conclusions that there's really substantial capacity for, for seaweeds to attenuate wave energy reducing you know, by 50, heights by 50 to 70% over, over the scale that they're looking at to making conclusions that they have negligible um, attenuation. And I guess this really comes at this idea that a lot of these studies are very site specific, species specific and application specific, um, where we really need to understand the processes, where um, understand how different types of species interact with the, um, the ocean currents and waves, um, how density, kelp size, the forest areas affect that. Um, and these are some other general uh, things that, for example, the attenuation really increases when seaweed's relatively rigid and buoyant. So it depends a lot on the material properties um, and also can be dependent on different um, wave characteristics. So to finish, I just wanna talk about what some of the research um, gaps are and where, where research is really, I think is needed. Um, I think a big challenge, as I mentioned, is the fundamental role that drag forces and being able to predict, give quantitative predictions to drag forces exerted on seaweed. Um, and this really gets at understanding um, the interaction in the, the how we can uh, predict drag forces, how that relates to um, flow speed, so the difference between 
Um, this is relative flow speed, the difference between the water and plant motion. Um, but also, um, seaweeds uh, essentially deform and how that frontal area exposed to the flow varies with different flow speeds. So this creates a big challenge because we have a coupled problem where when we exert a force on a seaweed, as you can see in this right here, it deflects and it becomes more, more streamlined. And so that actually reduces the drag force. So this is coupled, coupled problem where we need to understand how these drag forces affect um, this frontal area and how that depends on the geometry and also the material properties of the, the seaweed. Um, the way we also kind of characterize um, these, these um, dynamics is really looking at how seaweed responds to different forces. I'll probably just skip over this, um, but really we need to understand drag forces, but also how sea seaweeds respond to the material properties, so the resistance to, to bending and the buoyancy forces. Um, and this is really where I think understanding these dynamics, understanding um, and coming up with these predictive relationships is important in the context of um, physical modeling, where this is just an example of um, looking at how we can improve models um, to predict wave attenuation by seagrass. So it's not a, not a seaweed application, but it has some of the similar kind of ideas where if we can, in a controlled environment, um, in this case, a wave flume where we simulate waves, if we can come up with a mimic of um, that seaweed that has the, the similar material properties, so similar rigidity, similar um, buoyancy characteristics to, in this case, natural Posidonia australis, um, which you can see here. So this is work by um, Miriam Abdullah. And so you can see if we can recreate these mimics, we can, in a, in a controlled environment, we can, recreate the motion of natural seagrasses. And we can use this information to come up with predictive tools to understand um, how seagrass respond to, to waves, but also how um, that motion affects um, wave attenuation. Similarly, in the context of um, kelp studies, there's a limited number of, of studies, but these have proven really valuable in terms of um, coming up with ways that we can predict current and wave attenuation, coming up with predictive tools. Um, so this is a nice study by Joanna Rossman, at, um, did this at Stanford, um, where for the giant kelp models that, that has some of the material properties, the buoyancy properties, um, and looked at how these um, waves and currents interact with these kelp forests. And you can see some other examples here, including this more of an aquaculture application. Um, so finally, with improved knowledge of how seaweeds interact with um, hydrodynamic conditions, namely through drag forces, we can come up with tools then that can be used to aid design um, and, and come up with uh, predictions. And so this is really through, for example, numerical modeling tools, which are really fundamental for um, you know, aiding engineering design of offshore structures. Um, and so, for example, um, if we can parameterize the drag forces and the cumulative effect of, of these drag forces, um, we can embed these in numerical models, um, which have been recently incorporated, for example, in, in um, wave different types of wave models. This is some work we did, um, Arnold Van Rugen and um, Daniel Raj at UWA, where um, using, for example, a uh, wave, phase resolving wave model can parameterize um, vegetation, but in this case, making assumptions of rigid vegetation canopies. And you can see the wave attenuation that occurs as a result of having about 400 meters of that submerged vegetation. Similarly with, um, with, uh, wave energy devices, which are, um, these are point absorber wave energy devices that move with the motion um, and cause through drag forces, that motion is a bunch of energy. And we can look at the attenuation behind arrays of wave um, energy devices. Um, yeah, sorry, I'll just conclude. Um, so I think ultimately moving towards practical tools and guidelines um, where we can come up with simple tools that engineers can, can use.
And I'll just leave these summary points up here. I realize I'm over time. <laughs> thanks. Well, thank you very much, Ryan. Um, and thanks to all our presenters um, tonight. Um, I'm sure um, the audience enjoyed um, the presentations. We had a pretty good turnout tonight. Of um, and um, we do have a few questions, and we've got a few. We've got we've got another ten minutes or so um, for people to put um, questions into the Q and A window. Um, uh, and I know that some of us have to race off uh, right on time to other um, uh, to, to other. Uh, <laughs> whatever else people are doing around the world. Um, there's a question in the Q&A uh, from Bila around um, his thoughts around integrating wave energy converters and seaweed farming in offshore areas. And I, um, I, I suspect both Bila and, uh, and Ryan might be able to wade in on that, but we might start with Bila. You mean another kind of renewable energy by wave converters? I, 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 suspect, I suspect the question is about um, um putting um wave converting um uh wave converting materials into the anchoring systems for seaweed farms potentially ah okay so like a shock absorber i guess yeah we do this uh, actually there are not too many possibilities for that um i mean we all know that once we submerge the crop the orbital wave will decrease and the stress is lower but we need the irradiance. So the deeper we go, the less light we have. Um, so <clears throat> actually, yeah, shock absorbing systems, we don't have that. Uh, sorry, um, um, wave generators, or what did you say, the word wave something? So we have absorbing systems, which are included in the mooring, but they don't stop too much of the stress. There's nothing available on the market. If somebody has an idea, yes, I'm interested. Brian, you want to wait in there? Yeah, I, uh, similarly, I mean, it seems like uh, I, I agree that capacity would really be through mooring, you know, loads and having PTOs embedded in moorings. That, but I think it would depend on, um, you know, how the the loading and 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 the energy is generated. So, yeah, I'm not aware of any of that work kind of being done at the moment, but. Seems feasible. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, just going to the Q and A now. Um, just we've got a few more coming in. Um, yeah, so this is a question um, from Rob Hickson here in New Zealand, and and um, something that I think in the blue economy we're we're sort of uh, interested in, and that's around. Um, Bila, for your applications, have, have you guys considered uh, submerging your farms to get out of the way of weather, I guess? Um, you know, so taking the whole system down um, to depth in order to sort of avoid very high, you know, sort of high wind or high wave sort of action. Um, yes, we did that. Um, I mean, submerging systems, uh, and there's no solution all over the world. Uh, the problem is that the mooring compared with the buoyancy. So, for example, if you have a backbone device, whatever crop you have, to have the entire device submerged and that you don't have something coming up in the center of the, of the backbone, coming up to the surface, that is quite complicated. So you need more moorings, which is more expensive, and that hinders an easy operation and maintenance. And again, I mean, you can submerge seaweed species, some of them. For example, Naminaria digitata is adapted, or not digitata, Hyperborea is adapted to lower light. Um, but there is no system available. So it's all in, in, in the baby steps. And the deeper you go, the less light you have. So that is a you have to find out. Um, I mean, you can submerge some of the, the kelp species several meters, but not all of them. And we have included this in our design ideas, but we don't have a solution for that yet. And, and, and what about the possibility of, of submerging um, seaweed farms at night uh, to deeper waters to take up nutrients and bring, cycling them back to pick up light during the day? So we don't have the problem with nutrients, actually, because the, the North Sea um, has a natural eutrophication. 
Um, so uh, even well, it doesn't make any difference if you are uh, at the surface or deeper, uh, and even if it is light or not light. Uh, nevertheless, um, it is very rough. I mean, once you leave the island of Helgoland in a, uh, in, a, in a storm condition, you can have up to eight to 12 meters of wave. The significant wave height normally in a return period of 10 years is four meters um, or six meters. So it is extremely rough. I know that the deeper we go, it's better, but there's no device available on the market which can have a solution for buoyancy against moving. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Um, we've got a question here from uh, Zoe Battersill. Uh, is there a potential for modeling, uh, for the modeling to predict if and where strong currents or waves might be able to shift algal material uh, in regards to the risk of uncontrolled spread? Does someone want to tackle that on the panel? So this is about modeling. I guess this is more around, uh, if I read it right, more around sort of biosecurity issues and, and um, what might happen to material that does come off of farms. I can say at least one thing. Um, so of course it is, you transfer a species to an area where it normally is not growing. Uh, and you can have a loss but you will have the loss from the seaweed also from coastal areas. And that has not, nothing to do with the, uh, with the storm conditions. Most of the kelp species have a, a, a normal tip loss. So once you, you grow a seaweed and once you have it in a harvesting mode, so before it goes into reproduction or storage of sugar or whatever, it's okay. But once you leave it out there, so natural habitats, they have a typical tip loss. So they don't grow further because the meristem, which is growing, is at the same time losing by its end. Published by Kane in 1979, so it's a very old. Uh, so naturally, seaweed is transferred to offshore environments. Right. Anyone else want to wait in at Louise? I think you're on mute, Louise. No, I was just um, saying, yes, you're right, Bella. I mean, there's, um, I mean, that's always been a concern uh, at the moment, um, reading, uh, you know, the spore release and what happens. But yeah, water motion will, will transport blade material somewhere, but we're still trying to find out how far blade material really gets transported. And I think the, the, the general thing is basically use the species from around that area when you're growing it offshore. Um, but also, depending on how far offshore, if it's too deep, the seaweeds there, you know, the um, spores don't last that long anyway. They can't, they have to be, you know, within a certain, you know, in light levels to actually carry on so and be viable. So, yeah, depending on how far offshore we are, unless there's going to be stepping stones such as, um, you know, wave tides or wind farms, that could be, become a problem as well. Okay, um, so we're sort of coming towards the end of this uh, this webinar. I guess um, it would be uh, interesting if if um, each of the the panel might want to have some concluding remarks. Uh, Walter, you, perhaps you might like to kick off. No, oh, I think this was this was a a very interesting webinar. Um, yeah, what can I say? <laughs> uh, I think in response to the the last bit, it's yeah, I I totally agree. It's all. Context dependent and species dependent. Um, so if you culture macrocystis, obviously that naturally floats everywhere. Um, so if you culture that offshore, then sure. Um, any concluding remarks? I think the one thing to do is do more trials and start offshore, put lines out there and do it, I guess. Um, but yeah, Bela knows all the struggles, so. <laughs> Oh, great. Um, and uh, Louise, any, any sort of... I, this, I've actually just got a, this. Uh, John McDonald's asked a question. And it was just, do you think big good growth rates in south, south and eastern Australian current for macrocystis? Look, I mean, I'd say macrocystis can grow where it's optimal and it requires also nutrients as well as, I think, temperature is starting to become a problem for macrocystis. So depending on the temperatures there, as well as uh, as long as there's nutrient availability, they, they should be fine. 
Um, but no, it was actually, it's nice to see there was quite a, you know, the range, you know, of all the, you know, the, uh, the issues we need to consider when we're trying to think about growing stuff offshore and what does offshore actually mean in regards to like the loading, the drag, depth, um, infrastructure, how we go about it. So we're, we're sort of scraping, starting to get some knowledge, but I think there's still an awful lot to, to do. So yeah. thanks just for the invite and, and lend me and for the, being able to present this afternoon. Thanks, Louise. Um, and um, uh, Bila? Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you. First of all, I find it very interesting uh, all the work that was presented today. Um, I have to do one remark. Uh, as Lindsay, you may remember, I'm the chair of an international working group on open ocean aquaculture from the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea, which is located in Copenhagen, Denmark. And there we really try to find out what does really offshore mean. And we are all using this term offshore, but offshore is just a question of distance. Actually, we are more talking about exposure. Yeah, because that includes waves and currents. I know that most offshore sites are exposed, but we misuse this term offshore. We have offshore banking, we have offshore whatever, but <laughs> here, in terms of aquaculture, we should more use the term exposed. Uh, yeah, and thank you very much for this invitation. Well, thanks. Thanks, Bila. And, and Ryan, some closing words? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I really enjoyed the other talks and it just kind of highlights how multidisciplinary you know, some of these issues are. And I think the other interesting aspect is a lot of the conclusions and understanding of, um, you know, seaweeds come from natural, you know, the natural environment. And I think, it, you know, a lot of the talks highlighted some of the, you know, the assumptions that people make about how seaweeds occur in natural settings you know, how they translated aquaculture. So yeah, I really enjoyed the talks and thanks Lindsay for hosting. Well, thank you very much to all of you. Um, it was a really interesting evening and, and or evening for me here in New Zealand. I'm not sure, morning for, for Bila and, and others. Um, just a reminder to the folks who are still online, um, this was recorded and will be up on the, the Blue Economy uh, CRC's website in the coming days. Um, and so uh, please, um, if, if you miss parts of it, please um, avail yourself to that and keep an eye on um, the Blue Economy CRC's um, website for upcoming uh, webinars that you might be interested in. So thanks again to the presenters. Thanks for those who attended. And um, I guess we'll see you next time. Thanks very much. Thank you.